HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at HearstRanch.com. My name is Hannah Forden. I'm the membership coordinator at Heritage Radio Network, but even before I joined the team, I loved listening to HRN during my subway commute. It made the time go quickly and left me feeling inspired for the day ahead. HRN listeners tune in from all over the world, but there are a few traits that we all have in common, no matter where we listen from. A curious palate, the fierceness to make a difference, and a hunger for lifelong learning about the culinary world. As you know, Heritage Radio Network is a listener-supported nonprofit. To deliver the most ambitious, entertaining, and of-the-moment stories in 2018, we need your help. We need to raise $150,000 by December 31st to accomplish these goals and to keep your favorite shows on the air. Together, we can make this HRN's most exciting, impactful, and delicious year yet. Become a member by donating today. Join us at heritageradionetwork.org slash donate and you'll immediately start enjoying benefits such as VIP invitations to HRN events, where you will mix and mingle with your favorite hosts. Memberships also make a perfect holiday gift for all the foodies in your life. This year, why not give the gift of food radio? You'll hear your generosity in action for the year to come. Help keep our lights on and our mics hot by pledging your support today at heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. Thanks for listening. Welcome to the Grape Nation, your weekly wine journey. We have a special show, our first annual The Grape Nation Awards, and we'll also talk Santa Barbara wines with Tyler Thomas from Deerberg and Star Lane Vineyards. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Stay with us for The Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We bring wine to the people. Tyler Thomas is the winemaker at Deerberg and Star Lane Vineyards in the central coast of California near Santa Barbara. Is Deerberg the right way to pronounce it? You're correct. You got it. This is a very hot region, rhetorically, (laughs) but with a cooler climate. Fair? Fair. Tyler makes site-driven estate wines and believes the greatest wines are not made, but discovered by quality oriented individuals. We'll also present to you after Tyler the first annual The Grape Nation Awards. But first, let's talk to Tyler. We have Tyler in studio. Tyler's in New York from California, from Santa Barbara. Tyler, welcome to the show. Thanks thanks for having me. Thank you for coming by. Um, I thought it would be great to have you in here because obviously we talk a lot about wine, but one of the things we've not spent a lot of time with is Central Coast 
uh, wines, wines from the Santa Barbara wine uh, growing region. So having you here could sort of help me. So I think what I want to do is give me a quick primer on the region. Mm-hmm. Talk to me, not so much the history, mm-hmm. but what's going on there, the terroir, you know, the wineries, you, you know, what's happening there. And then we'll talk about you and we'll talk about, you know, the wines at your winery. Sure. Yeah, so Santa Barbara County is is on the southern end of what's known as the Central Coast, which basically extends from San Jose south to Los Angeles. And what's unique about Santa Barbara County in particular is it's one of the only, I think the only place along the entire North American West Coastline where the mountain ranges run east-west. The ridges run east-west, not north-south. And so it creates a really unique uh, growing condition with cold air coming from the ocean from east to west. And Santa Barbara is, uh, there's, there's a phrase about Virginia they use in their state marketing and Virginia is for, for lovers. lovers. And so I've co-opted that to say, you know, Santa Barbara County is for wine lovers. Okay. Like if you want to go to the Mecca of domestic wine production, you're probably going to Napa, Sonoma. Right. There's great restaurants there. Have fun. The wines are good. I get it. But if you really love wine, Santa Barbara is a really great place because we can do so many varieties well. We also have a lot of creative uh, young winemakers who are not uh, having to be sort of pigeonholed into a style of right. a place. There's not the same sort of a singular identity uh, with it. Maybe which, with Pinot which is and Chard, changing but, in Nap and Sonoma. But I think you guys came out of the gate where the diversity and creativity is, you know, welcome. There's right. not a house style. There, there's not a house style which really affords winemakers the opportunity to, to kind of explore a lot of different angles on different varieties too. So we have. On the western end, toward the coast, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, other cool climate uh, varieties. Uh, in the central area, there's Ballard Canyon and the San Jose Valley, which is becoming more and more known for Syrah. Uh, there's a newly minted AVA called Los Olivos District, uh, where people are putting Italian varieties in addition to both Bordelais varieties and Syrah. And then where our, one of our, where our winery is and one of our three estates is out in Happy Canyon, uh, which was minted as an AVA in 2009. It's the furthest east and the warmest Appalachian. So let's tell people what an AVA is. It's really a grower region, a growing region, but right. it stands for American Viticultural Viticulture. Area. And right. just quickly, give me a definition. So it's it's a geographical, uh, geographically recognized region that has some several differentiating propositions about it, usually relating to climate and soil type um it's not necessarily tethered to specific grape varieties like they might be in europe but but people will put it on their wines which indicates where the wines grew exactly exactly so how many growing regions avas are in the santa barbara you're putting me on the spot so santa barbara county doesn't count as an ava it's just the county right there's santa maria valley uh, San Inez Valley, right. Los Olivos District, Ballard Happy, Canyon, Happy, Happy Canyon, Canyon, and Santa Rita Hills. I think five or six, so five, right? Yeah, five or six. Um, now, the terroir varies? It does. Uh, b- between all the uh, areas? It, it, it I does. I know you just talk climate. You know, wet, west is close to the ocean, right. east. The mountains run east-west. Right. So the but what about the soils? So soils are typically a a sandy loam on the on the coastlines. Uh, there's there's well in Santa Rita Hills. There's what they call chert or diatomaceous earth that that influences the soil. When you get to as you go east, you get more and more serpentine driven soils. What does that mean? Um, serpentine is the is the state rock of California. Oh, okay. What it means for the vines is there's there's a lot of magnesium in the soil, which creates challenges for the vines, which can be good as long as there's not too much. What if it does that translate into flavor? Not that we can specifically right. tie to, but it, if you stress a vine, it translates to flavor. Right. And you can stress it with water. You can stress it with mineral deficiencies. It, it's good for the. It can be good for the wine. Right. Yeah. So. And, and topographically, too, you're looking at hillsides primarily through the region. There, there are things planted on what you might consider valley floor, but a lot of it's rolling hills into mountains. So you take advantage of the mountain oh, yeah. range everywhere. Yeah. 
um, I guess, east and west facing mountains, right? Uh, if and north south and north, right? Yeah, yeah, everything. They, I yeah. guess. Now let's talk about grape varietals. I would assume there's a predominant set of grapes. You yeah. mentioned a few. So the the region's probably known mostly for Santa or uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Right. But but if you name it, it might be there. I mean, they really are. Uh, they people have explored a lot of different things, but I'd say principally you've got Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, uh, Syrah. There's there's uh, I, I, I've seen some Tempranillo, Sangiovese, um, Chenin Blanc. Um, you know we've got all five Bordelais varieties. Sauvignon Sauvignon Blanc and Happy Canyon is uh, is really grown. Um, so again, it's 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 a small area. It's really not that far to drive, say from the east to the west. But you you span sort of the kind of global varieties that people associate with right. with uh, so, typical so wine. So obviously everyone is growing grapes that make sense to the area. So the Pinot and the Chard, like you said, mm-hmm. will be in the cooler climate. They're not necessarily growing the Syrah where they're growing the uh, Chard and Pinot, are they? I mean, are they coming in a little? A little bit because you know in California our cool climates aren't cold climates. No. So so you can make sort of a cool climate uh, Syrah, but they're not usually to the extreme western portions. Right. Uh, but they exist in Santa Maria. We, we make a little Syrah from Santa Maria, and then uh, there's f- some people that have it in the Santa Rita Hills too. Do you see now more than before people breaking away from the traditional set of grapes? Like you said, Tempranillo and Shannon. Are people planting more or it just doesn't make sense to use acreage for that you know it's a good question because i think that younger smaller producers would like to try different varieties but they don't have the capital to have the land and and put in the money to invest so it's about convincing a a grower to to do it Uh, i would say that it is going on in santa barbara i mean there's riesling that's there uh, Graham Tatomer, uh, Tatomer, sorry, Graham. Um, <laughs> uh, y- you know, so it, it's there. We, we've put in a little bit of Chenin Blanc. We even tried some Nebbiolo. You know, it's just a part of um, long-term planning. And, and, you know, with climate change, who knows what's actually going to be best in certain areas in right. 50, 70 years. It's an expensive experiment. Yeah. You know, to take up that kind of acreage and right. do all of that. But it's definitely driven by the, the main varieties. Uh, and I think for good reason. Yeah. Now, you've been out there for years, and you were familiar with the region. I've seen, and I'm sure you have, a proliferation of wineries. I mean, I think there's a couple of hundred wineries spread out through all those growing regions. Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah. Yeah, it sounds right. I mean, in the do you look back in the last five years, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 wineries popped up that weren't there? Not not that many, but it's, there's definitely a proliferation. Now, I've, I've been down there for four and a half years now, so I moved down from Napa, Sonoma. But you knew the region. I knew the region, and what's interesting is the <coughs> locals that I've met since I've moved down there, oh, there's so many wineries. It's, it's really proliferated. It's like, well, it's proliferated everywhere. Right. You know, there's more wineries in Napa and Sonoma, yeah. Lodi. Proportionately. I mean, yeah. yeah so, so proportionally, I think the region has grown as the industry has grown. It does, I think, afford the opportunity for some young winemakers to try things, like I said before, where they're not tethered to a specific style. And I think that's attracted a lot more small, really right. small wineries. Right. Yeah. Um, is, is that a good thing? I mean, people coming in and, and growing grapes? I, I think I mean, it's a great thing. There's not uh, too many wineries. Nobody's I, there doing a crappy job. I mean, their hearts into it, right? When when you come to visit me, well, I won't say nobody's doing a crappy job. There's always not a, a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, when you come visit me, you, when you drive around, you'll it won't feel like there's just wineries popped up all over. The, not in like Santa, driving up twenty nine in Napa. No, you don't get that vibe. Not at all. I mean, it feels still very rural and sort of. Uh, country It's got chic. that vibe. Yeah. Now, this is a silly question, and it wasn't on my notes, but was that the region where the movie Sideways was? It was. It was Right, like yeah. Hitching Post. Right. And San- yeah, That's so I mean, region. people have a familiarity with it without realizing it. Right. Because, I mean, all the driving around in that movie and right. all the restaurants, so that's Santa Barbara. But 
it had that vibe then, you know, where it was you right. know, very agriculturally oriented and all that. All right, so I need you to tell me, tell me about some of the qualities and characteristics of the wines um, that come out of the region. And for guys like me who probably drank too much Napa and Sonoma wine, mm-hmm. tell me some of the characteristics and traits that are different that come out of the climate and the region and the soil and all right. of that you know what are, what are we tasting i mean what's there's not like like we said earlier there's not a house style but you have a cooler client how do you differentiate the pinot and the shard from you know up north and all of that i think the number one factor is freshness you know that the the wines have a uh, and I, by that, I don't just mean higher acidity. You know, I, I think they or have, younger, <laughs> or younger. There, right. There's a, a a fresher fruit flavor. Uh, there's an embracing uh, of, of fresh herbs in more savory driven varieties like Syrah and Cab, um, and then and then also a suppleness and a, and a freshness due to acidity. But wait, help me and the listeners. Where does the freshness come from? Why do you feel it could be fresher than, let's say? Uh, I, I think Sonoma the, Shard. One thing the area allows us to do, partly because of our limited rainfall. So, our average rainfall might be say sixteen inches a year, in the winter, and Napa Sonoma might be forty to fifty. Right. So right and that, there, that creates a lot lower vigor in the vine, which allows for I think earlier flavor development and textural development, more depth at lower potential alcohols, higher acidity. So if you're, if you're getting that flavor development a little earlier and you're able to harvest with uh, higher acidities, you're going to have fresher flavors and a little more acidity, but you're not going to compromise the substance, right. the texture, the depth of, of, and layers of flavor. That's what I've seen based on, I used to source you know 14 to 16 vineyards a year in Sonoma County and one in Mendocino. Um, and to get the same depth of flavor, I felt like there I had to pick a little bit riper. And so I would say the wines have different shape to them. That one way for people to think about it, you get a little bit rounder, not in a fat way, but just a little bit sort of rounder right. shape. Generally speaking, say on the Sonoma Coast versus Santa Rita Hills, you have a little bit more angles. It's like the, there's something extended and more linear and precise about the wines, even though the flavor profiles might be somewhat expressive and big. Right. What... um. Is that indicative of all the grapes? Pinot, Chard, Syrah? I can say for ourselves, yes. So, because okay. we have we have vineyards in three of the main AVAs, and we grow all five Bordelais Reds. We have Sauvignon Blanc, Syrah, and then Pinot and Chard. So, for us, uh, yeah, I think we're we're really the region is allowing us to do that in all those varieties. Right. All right. So let's talk about let's talk about where you are. You are in a family-run winery. Right. Um, it's Deerberg and Star Lane. Right. Star Lane is one of the vineyards. Star Lane is one of the vineyards and one of the brands. So we make a Deerberg label with the Pinot Noir and Chardonnay from our two coastal vineyards. Right. And then under the Star Lane label, we have Star Lane Vineyard where we make the Bordelais varieties. Now... So the Star Lane is a Bordelais variety. It's all estate grown? All of it. And you grow, do you grow the five different blending grapes? Yep. And I guess the mix blend each year varies or? It it varies. We want the signature, say, of the Cabernet to be Cabernet. So we may use uh, Merlot or Cap Franc or Petit Verdot, what have you, um, to craft the wine with the right texture. But the identity, we want the identity to be Cabernet Sauvignon. So you brought in a bottle of wine. Our good buddy Sam popped it. Um, tell me what you brought in. So we brought our 2014. So this is the Star Lane. Star Lane. This is a Cabernet. We talked a lot about Pinot and Chard and right. even Syrah, but ironically, we're drinking a Cab. Right. But that's the wheelhouse of Star Lane, like you said. It is. One of the wheelhouses. It, yeah, I mean, I... I think at Deerberg and Star Lane, we're, we're very proud of the, the Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. What's cool about this wine is it's just, it's, it's a different place to go get cab. I mean, at Happy Canyon, in the eastern end of Santa Barbara County, uh, we're part of pioneering what this region's going to be like. And that's for, really exciting. For cab? or Yeah, for Cabernet. 
Yeah, because I was going to ask. I mean, how many people are committed to growing the five blending grapes, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cab Frank Melba? Yeah, not a lot. Not a lot. I mean, I mean, when Jim and Mary Deerberg searched for like 10, or 15, 10 to 12 years for land to buy to develop into a Cabernet, they iconic Cabernet They wanted land vineyard. that they knew they could grow all those grapes. Right. And they looked in Napa and Sonoma, and they thought, this, is, this was in the 80s and 90s, and they're thinking this is getting too crowded. Right. Um, and so now we're down in this area that isn't as well known for it. But I think, uh, again, just using those parameters I described before, we're, we're able to kind of craft something that I think is special, is unique, but it's still Cabernet. Right. Um, so I asked you this earlier. Let's apply it specifically to this. So this is a Star Lane cab. Mm-hmm. Um, this is from Happy Canyon, which is one of the growing regions we talked about, Santa Barbara. Um, how many different grapes are blended in here? That one actually has all five. All five. So yeah. your five. But Bordeaux. the Malbec was just for topping. There's right. like 1% of Malbec in there. Right. So I asked you generally for other wines, how would we compare this to what people are more familiar with, which is, you know, a Sonoma Steakhouse cab or all the Napa name cabs? Right. Where do you, what's the differentiators? I think the differentiating proposition is that our we're, we're embracing fresh herbs, which some people so are the like, freshness they, that they we confuse, talked about. Yeah, and they confuse that with maybe greenness, but we're not talking vegetables here. We're talking sage, a thyme. more herb than like pepper, green pepper, e- exactly, which and is more savory, right? And there's but there is dark fruit in the background, and then texturally the wine. If you're comparing it to Napa Sonoma, people would probably say this is lighter. I mean. I wouldn't. I would say it's supple, and and uh, and kind of linear and fresh, but it isn't as rich and opulent as a lot of the wines produced but in the North Coast. There's an interesting thing going on, and you're very well aware of it. You know, for many years, the Robert Parker opulent, over the top Napa cabs ruled. I think there's a movement towards restraint. Yeah. Do you agree? Yes. Oh, totally. I, I think that... I mean, the, the guys that are making that stuff are still making it, but right. people are making newer wines and all that. This is more in the profile of restraint. And right. Well, the reason I hesitate is because I feel like in my career, I've been a part of wineries that that's what we've always done. What do you mean? They're, they're, opulence was never our goal. Balance was always our goal. That was in 2004 when I was in a, a, re, a, a winery at Napa, but we were an outlier. We were kind of like, oh, that's cute what you guys are doing down there. Right. But I think you're right. I think the conversation is changing, and it's very healthy. Right. What? Um, give me a mix of the wines that you make. Do you make product? So you have basically Pinot, Chard. You're making. You're yeah. you're farming the three different regions. You're wine making in all those areas. Right. Just give me production as far as the grape. You're doing the most, what, Pinot, Chard? The most we're doing is, is Chard, Pinot, and Cabernet. Okay. And, and Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. We kind of do equal amounts of those. Um, and then we do a little bit of Merlot, a little bit of Cabernet Franc, a single bottling, some Syrah. Um, we actually have Syrah from two vineyards, which is cool. One cool climate, one out in Happy Canyon. Right. Um, we do a rosé out of Malbec. We only do like 100 cases, but it's, it's a really All fun Malbec wine. All Malbec rosé? 100%. Wow. That's, yeah. That's fun. Is that a seasonal thing? Yeah, just in, the, just in the spring. It's that usually gone by the end of summer. So one of the things you and I talked about off air was, you know, the fact that you're out there. Um, the winery is not huge, but, you know, it's a nice operation. The distribution of the wines, mm-hmm. you know, is challenging sometimes. Right. We're in New York. We're at Roberta's, which is a cool place. Brooklyn's very hip. Um, the wines are not always available everywhere. So let's tell people if they want to know more about the wine, let's first drive them to a website. Where would they go? Well, they can always learn, you know, about the wines from us. Uh, but I mean, you know, specific bottlings and purchase and all of that. They can go to the Deerberg they can go Star to Lane. DeerbergVineyard.com okay. or StarLaneVineyard.com. They're 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 connected sites but separate. And you do um, mailing list. We do mailing list. You can buy direct from us. Uh, okay. There are shops in town that have it in, in Manhattan that have it. Right. Um, I know Verve Wines, Dustin Wilson right. is has been out to the winery and a support you know, is a is a supporter, which I really appreciate. I think they they he's 
understands what we're trying to accomplish. Right. And he's um, a guy that yeah. that knows. You know, I'm sure you'll have more people. But I think if people are interested in trying wines from the central coast from Santa Barbara, I think they should start with going on your site. Um, I think there's a lot to pick from. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about stuff that probably wasn't even on the website, like a Malbec Rosé or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the big wines like Pinots and Shards and this Central Coast Cab, mm -hmm. um, if any of our listeners want to try it, just go to the website. Um, you know, you said over and over that you're making wines of freshness and mm -hmm. texture. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what you're going to get, you know, mm -hmm. when you taste these wines. Um, we're going to have to wrap up. I got to throw you the hell out of here. Is there anything we missed that's important? No, but congratulations on uh, one year on the show. And, Thank and you. And your award show. I think that's really Thank cool. Thank you. I wish we had more time. Uh, maybe we'll check back with you. Um, let's talk about the fact that the Central Coast Santa Barbara is an incredible place to visit, yeah. an incredible wine region to visit. If yeah. you're out there, look for uh, Deerberg and Star Lane. Um, I, without even asking him, I'm sure if you get out there, Tyler's walking around, you know, doing stuff and all of that. You could probably call in advance, set up tastings. You should try and buy some wines. Um, and thank you for stopping by. Thank you, Sam. Um, like I said, we'll check back with you. Thank you for the uh, Cabernet. It's delicious. I'm always looking to try uh, new wines, and I've never had this before. So thank you, Tyler Thomas from Deerberg and Star Lane, Star Lane Vineyards for coming in. You bet. Thanks. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to come back and do our The Grape Nation Wine Awards. Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. The Hearst family has been raising cattle on the rich, sustainable native grasslands of California's Central Coast for over 150 years. Piedra Blanca Rancho in San Simeon is the original Hearst Ranch, founded by George Hearst in 1865. George's son was the famous publisher, William Randolph Hearst. In addition to being known for building the iconic Hearst Castle, William was, like his father before him, an avid rancher. In his words, I would rather spend a month at the ranch than any place in the world. Thanks to one of the largest land conservation easements in California history, a joint effort with the California Rangeland Trust, the American Land Conservancy, and the state of California, the working landscape at Hearst Ranch will be preserved forever. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at hearstranch.com. All right, welcome back. We're back, and I want to welcome you to the first annual The Grape Nation Awards. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Tonight, we recognize and award guests and events from the past year on The Grape Nation. All categories were created and selected by me, your humble host. There was absolutely no science or deep thought that went into this process. There are no accountants waiting in the wings with the winning envelopes. What you see is what you get. So this year, we're going to present six different awards, and we'll have the opportunity to speak with some of the winners via phone live. We have them on standby. So here we go. The first award is Favorite Wine Restaurant or Wine Bar. This is a question we asked our guests during the weekly wine list feature. Um, it's a question that reoccurred every week and every guest had to give us a couple of choices and the winner by most guest mentions, cause I tallied all of them from all the shows is a wonderful wine bar down in Soho, Compagnie de Vin Su Natural. And I think we have Caleb Ganser on the phone. He's the managing partner and he's going to uh, jump on the line and accept uh, his award. Do we have Caleb on the line? 
Hey, Sam, how are you? Hey, man, congratulations. Hey, congratulations to you, one year down. There you go. So one of the things we did that was nice is we had a reoccurring uh, questionnaire for our guest experts, and we asked them, you know, what's your favorite wine restaurant or bar? And we had a lot of industry people. We had a lot of authors. We had a lot of winemakers. And I did the tally, and the majority um, destination was your place. And I understand why. Yeah. So Caleb is at Company Divin Sunatral, downtown Manhattan, um, on Center Street. And you're doing a lot of cool stuff down there. Tell me some of the stuff well, you're thank doing. Thank you very much. You're doing mixtape. You're doing Jurassic Park. You're trying to keep moving all the time. Tell me a few things that you've been doing and what's coming up for the holidays. I mean, look, we're, we're deeply humbled by, you know, A, that we just have guests that come and take kind of the crazy stuff that we're, we're trying to do. Um, and thank you for, you know, for giving us a shout, you know, giving us a chance to chat about it. Um, you know, look, life is short and we get bored very easily and we just want to take advantage of every single day that we have. Um, you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. So we just want to do all sorts of crazy stuff. Like we love wine and we just want to share that love with people in, a, in an approachable way. Um, you know, so a lot of the formal sort of tastings and things, you know, we leave for other places and we just want to like kind of let loose and just drink some wine and have a good time. Uh, well, for the holidays, and we have another mixtape coming up. So the next one is uh, next Monday, actually. Let's tell everyone uh, quickly. Tell everyone quickly yeah. what the mixtape is. Yeah. So the mixtape is essentially we invite somebody to come in and do like an anti wine dinner. So if it's uh, <laughs> if it's a winemaker, we don't really want them to pour a bunch of their wines because they can go visit them and their their respective uh, winery and go do that. When they're here, we want them to see a snapshot of the wines that they like to drink and also the music that they like to listen to. So it's really kind of like a takeover. And they pour maybe one wine, of course, and they have a little bit of context of theirs. But everything else is like almost like a DJ set where, you know, if you go listen to an artist do a DJ set, they play right. a bunch of tracks they, they like to listen to, not their own. And that's what this is with wine. That's um, great. And there's a musical component where they make the playlist and they're behind the bar pouring and it's kind of a fun tasting. And, then and uh, we've had you know, all sorts of different people come and, and uh, do that with us. And it's been, it's been awesome. Right. Um, and this next installation is going to be, uh, I think, what, the 18th, Monday the 18th? Right. It's a mystery wine mixtape. So it's actually going to be a flight of blind wines. Well, and people are kind of competing against each other. Let's tell We're everyone what... we guest pouring it. Tell everyone what mystery and, wine is at your place. So, yeah, we also do a mystery wine regularly. Um, essentially, it's a wine that we're always pouring by the glass. That's uh, it's in our buy-the-bottle menu somewhere. Um, but you just have to kind of guess what it is. Right. And if you get it right, you... You win a bottle of it. If you get it wrong, then you bought a glass of wine, and then you have to follow up the Instagram Amen. to see what it is. Uh, and we reveal it to the, the world all at once. So you do a mystery wine mixtape night, correct? Exactly. So this is, yeah, everybody's going to be getting six fine wines, and they're going to have to fill out, uh, you know, all the information that they think it is. And whoever gets the, the answer, you know, the most right answers is going to win a magnum of wine. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Caleb, listen, you got a good thing going there. You got a good feel for it. The place when you walk in, you get the vibe. Like you said, life's short. It's a very fun place. The people there are very committed. The selection is great. The vibe is good. And I understand why all our guests, don't forget, industry people, writers, all of that, you know, put you at the top. So congrats, and thank you for jumping on the line with us. And we'll see you soon, Super all right? Humble, thank you so much. All right, Congratulations. Man. Thank you. Look forward to another year of uh, Great Nation. You got to come back on, right? You bet. I'll, I'll be there. All right. Thanks. All right. Cheers. All Have right. a great show. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right. We're going to move on to our second award. Our second award is Favorite Wine Guest. This is a totally subjective award. This award was selected by me. Like I said, totally subjective. The winner is Pascaline Le Peltier. And the reason I picked Pascaline is I fell in love with her when I met her. And I think she's been a guest on the show twice. She came on when she was working at Rouge Tomate. And she also co-wrote a book. She co-wrote a book with uh, Alice Firing. Um, the Dirty Guy to Wine, which is currently out right now, and got a good shout-out in the New York Times. Like I said, I fell in love with Pascaline when I met her, and she's truly one of the great people on the wine scene today. So, Pascaline, congratulations. You are the favorite wine guest of the great nation for the past year. 
A uh, dis- thank you so much. A distinction you know well deserved. Thank you so much. It's because I got you drunk, Sam. It's the only reason why I got the award, you know? Is that Too it? Too much miscade. <laughs> Too much miscade. <laughs> That's right. So, Pascaline, you've had a very, very busy year. You, you left a place that you worked at for many years. You went out and wrote a terrific book with a great partner, and now you're doing some interesting things on top of traveling all over the place. So tell me what you're doing right now. Uh, what's going on right now? Uh, you know, uh, you told me you were doing some work with uh, Racines and Chamber Street and all that. Tell me what you're into now. So what I'm into now, yeah, no, I'm a... I'm a I decided to take a couple of months off to be able to go back and travel and see friends and be able to do a lot of uh, wine-related projects from making wine to writing another book to uh, be able to uh, hang out and spend time on the floor with people I I tremendously love and I I learn a ton from uh, before going back uh, uh, first quarter of 2018 back on the floor somewhere. So uh, just, you know, being able to... uh, to catch up a brief and to understand really what matters in this industry, you know, things we talked about right. and why right. we we come up first in a in the restaurant world and the wine world and why we we are in this world and we tend to forget when we are swallowed by the crazy rhythm of New York City. So, um, well, that, that's, yeah, I just finished a book. Um, that, the that's book got a uh, mention in the New York Times from Eric Asimov today as one of the... Best wine books of 2017 and a great gift. Yes, that was um, that was a, a fantastic surprise from um, yep from Eric and um, that was really awesome that we um, so that, we had that and um, that's the dirty guy to yeah, wine. It's at all bookstores and on Amazon now. So good luck with that. And for everything you just said, all the passion and looking beyond just what we do every day, how you perceive the wine. Uh, business, the wine world, the people in it, and all of that. That's why I yeah. made you my favorite wine person because you get all of that like nobody I've met on this show. So I award you with this award, favorite wine person, and I thank you for coming on. Right. And thank you so I much hope for, to raise a glass with you in the next few weeks before the holidays. I'll come down looking for you. <laughs> it will be with pleasure. All right. It will be fantastic. Thanks Th- a lot, Sam. Thank Thanks. you, Pascaline. Thanks, Thanks for you jumping too, on. All right, so let's move on to our third award. The third award is an interesting category, a category that I thought up because when I heard it, I had to create a category and I had to create an award for it. And the third award is for the best rant on the Grape Nation. The winner is Patrick Capiello from the Walnut Street Cafe in Philadelphia. And you know Patrick formerly from Pearl and Ash and Rebel. And I had him in here, and we were talking about the business, and we got to talking about millennials, and it set him off on a rant on how millennials have sort of affected wine, wine service, and the wine business. So I'm going to play you the clip, and then we're going to jump on the phone with uh, Patrick and give him uh, a little love and have him accept his award. So, Vitor, can you play the Patrick Capiello Millennial Wine Rant? I think that the whole country and the whole world is, is facing the fact that consumers of food and wine are different now, right? Millennials have a different way of approaching things. And I've always connected with millennials. I'm a Gen Xer, but I've always felt connected to the millennial generation because um, I think that they question authority in a way that maybe my generation didn't, and, and I like that. I'm inspired by it. All, all of my sommeliers are from that generation, and, and I admire it. So that's great, but at so the same time... The, the market is being dominated 100%. Millennials by millennials. Are che- 100%. They're and they're inquisitive, time. like you said, right. and active. But they're also, they also don't necessarily want to be conventional. They don't want to necessarily follow the idea of, well, this is the way my parents ate, so I should eat the same way. They're kind of like, fuck that. I don't want to eat that way. I want to eat how I want to eat. And, you know, they're, they're changing the game in some ways and in, in not great ways from somebody, you know, who runs a restaurant. Give me but that's one way, of the not great ways. I mean, look at the way that they consume. The way they consume everything is different, right? They don't own televisions, first of all, which is fucking Watches, insane to me. Landline phones. No, no, nothing. Like, so, like, so, but, but they also don't, they don't, it's, it's, they, they, the, the way that they don't go to the movies, right? 
it's it's crazy, and they don't like they don't, they don't have really cable go to restaurants. TV. Exactly, right. and they don't really go to restaurants. They 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 want to go. They want to stop in a restaurant and eat something, and then they want to go to a bar and have a drink, and then they want to have a bite to eat later. They want to keep they want to keep moving. They their their attention span is of a certain point, and them sitting down in a restaurant and having a two and a half hour meal over several bottles of wine, like you and I like to do, not really in their you know view. Also, they're from a different economic uh, thing. I mean, there's a lot more of them. They're fighting for jobs. A lot of them still live in the less fucking money. basement. Of course. So right. it's, it, that's hard, and I get they're that. They're not balling with bottles of 100%, wine. 100%, and they don't they, want to. They'd rather rent their apartment while they go to Spain for a month right. and Airbnb it. I would. I don't want any to be strangers sleeping in my fucking bed. I'm not airbnb in my no. apartment ever. That's that's insanity. But like millennials have no problems doing that. That's weird shit to me. But I understand I it, and I, and, I, and, I want, and I want to understand how we, how, we, how we work on that. So, you know, at Rebel, We've done a lot of things. We started doing delivery. You know, we we've, we we were open as an all-day cafe. You have an opportunity to roll in there with a laptop and have a cafe, have a have a you know cup of coffee. Melissa Weller, who's doing our pastries, you can have a little snack. Daniel Eddy, who's the chef, will make a you know a, a steak sandwich for you. We're trying to understand it. And then in the evenings, it's the same thing, like having a, a you know a bar menu that's a little more casual. It's not like they're asking for hamburgers and French fries like you and I were. They're asking for different stuff. They they appreciate. Great products, healthy. And it, it, healthy is a hundred percent part of it. Yeah, kind of cool and rustic. Yes, I would say that they're like Small things like plates. roast chicken and like there, there. It's it's stuff that you and I would eat that our that our mom would make, but maybe they ha- didn't have the opportunity to right. have those kind of home cooked meals. So they don't know how to cook themselves, which I really think is what it's what it probably is. Most millennials probably are not awesome home cooks because they live in tiny apartments or they're always on the run. Or I agree. Yeah. So anyway, I, I that's agree. a rant right there. I need a drink. So the pivot, <laughs> the, the pivot was to the millennials because they're an important segment of your market. Hundred percent. So you everybody, adopt to that. Everybody's doing it, man. You have to. You have to adopt to it. Yeah. You have. You have to look at the fact that they're controlling things now and either get on board or get out of their way. I think is the way you got to look at it. All right, that was Patrick ranting about millennials. Like it or not, man, we're stuck with them. I mean, all three of my kids are millennials, so I'm like up to my ass in millennials. So, Patrick, that was a spot-on rant about what's going on in the world with millennials and our business and wine and all of that. You agree now that you hear it again? What's that? Do I agree? Yeah. I fucking hate millennials now. I closed another restaurant because of them. <laughs> oh, my God. I, did, I didn't think this would take a turn for the worst or whatever. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. No, I mean, it's still the truth, man. You know, it's still the truth. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be until we, until we as uh, wine and, and uh, restaurateurs figure it out, there's going to be a lot of, um, you know, kind of movement in the industry, I, I would know. say. But, you know. You know, it's funny. They when, are a force to be reckoned with, for sure. And I still stand by my belief that they're a pretty cool generation. When you went off on that, my oldest son was sitting here. And <laughs> when the show was over and, you know, we all parted ways, I took my kid out for a bite. And he said, Jesus Christ, that guy, because he's a millennial, he goes, that guy was spot on, man. It was a little eerie. So it kind of, <laughs> it kind of stuck in my mind. I said, you know, there's been a lot of great guests and a lot of great, you know, discussions and rants, but, you know, that one. So we created the award for you, the best rant, and we honor you with the Grape Nation Award for the best rant. So congratulations. It's an honor. Thank you, and Sam. And congratulations to you. It's thank awesome, you. Man. One year. Now let's uh, just talk about what's going on with you. You have a killer opening in opened already in Philadelphia, the Walnut yeah. Street Cafe. I'm spending, I'm spending a lot of time in Philadelphia right now. We're really excited. Uh, yeah, it's been the reception in the city's been awesome. Um, you know, it's it's cool to be outside of New York, but yep. also be close enough that I can get back to it on a, on, a, on a on an hour long train ride. So uh, yeah, yeah it, living it, living in both cities and and enjoying it for and, sure. And you know, we're. Like I said, we've we've we felt the love from Philly. You know, it's a little scary. I, I you and I have talked about this before. You know, I'm 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 an, I'm a uh, I'm a Rangers fan through right. and through. I, I bleed blue. We hate the six. And, you know, uh, the to, to go to flyers. Philadelphia where the fucking Flyers fans are insane. I mean, they killed a Rangers fan once. I don't know. If you remember I know. That. <laughs> it's a little scary. <laughs> so, needless to say, I don't bring. I never. I didn't bring my my uh, Rangers jersey to my apartment in Philly. I'm. I'm it's I keep a good that idea. In my New York apartment. I think <laughs> other than the Sixers, a fan, an opposing fan, has been killed. At an Eagles game and a Flyers game and maybe even a Phillies game, insane. Um, but you know what? They're passionate. <laughs> so tell me, tell me what else? Sadly, you closed Rebel. Can we expect yeah. any other things going on in New York? 
You know, um, there's some stuff in the works. I think, uh, you know, both in New York and possibly elsewhere as well. You know, okay. I've also been um, working on a wine project with my with my friend uh, Pac Malley, who makes wine in Sierra right. Coast. So him and I made a wine together that should be coming out shortly. I'm going to be bottling at that actually this weekend. So uh, spending a lot of time in Sonoma County, which is really great. Um, you know, wait, so back know what up to do with me in that town. Every time I go to the coffee shop to get a cup of coffee, I think they're afraid I'm going to rob them. But <laughs> right, right, right. So back up. So I know Pax has been making wine for a while. You and him are going to release. Lisa Wine, a collaboration? We are, yeah, cool. yeah. Pax is one of my best friends. I spent a lot of time with him, and, you know, I spent so much time at the winery, like, quote-unquote, working harvest, which usually means me standing around drinking Modellos, watching them work, Right. that this year we said, why the hell are you actually making a wine? So uh, so Pax and I made a, made a bottle of wine together. Uh, we're going to do a bottling that actually we're going to we're gonna do. The proceeds are going to go for um, the charity that we started, the uh, uh, Wildfire Relief. Well, I wanted to... We started. I wanted uh, to talk to you about going. I don't know if you've seen this. The fire started down now down south outside yeah, of LA. Yeah, right in and, LA. You know, the um, four or five guys are at risk down there. So yeah. the wildfire uh, charity is still up and running, and we're going to be doing more events for that um, to try and help out. But this bottling will 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 we'll give the proceeds to uh, to that charity. So two things: one, when when is that wine going to be uh, released? Um, it won't be released until either the spring or the fall. Um, okay. We're gonna, we'll, you know, like I said, it's, it's it's ready to be bottled, and we're gonna taste it while I'm while I'm there, and we'll make the decision if we want to release it in the spring or in the fall. Okay. We'll, we'll we'll figure it out. I think I would like to get it to market quicker than the sooner the later, especially because we really want to get the money into the the charity. You know, because there are people that are hurting right now. A lot of people lost their houses right. in, the, in the fires up in Sonoma and uh, Napa, and you know we're trying to do our best. We raised we raised one hundred and fifty thousand dollars so far. We we just submitted um, um, those proceeds all to to families in in wine country so people are benefiting from already so thank you let's, for helping us promote it on the show let's tell people, people what it is give me the continue name of give me the name of the uh project sure it's winemakers and sommeliers for Cal- for california wildfire relief and, and the, the website is i think easy but maybe i'm maybe i'm crazy it's ws, W-S- S- right cwr.com and the you can follow us on Instagram and hear of our events that are going on. Or if you go to the website, you can donate. You can buy tickets. There's an event tonight in Nashville, and then there's a few other coming coming up in other cities to be announced. Um, so we'll be doing. We're already planning our, our one in LA to respond to the fires that are happening right now. So, great idea. So know, the, this is a charity that I wish would actually run out at some point. I wish wildfires weren't existing, but unfortunately, it's you can't crazy. You can't stop wild. I mean, you can't you know prevent wildfires. No, it's unfortunately crazy. they happen. But you can st- you can help uh, you know aid the people that are affected. So, so that's, that's what we're trying to do. That's a great cause. And the last thing I wanted to ask you is when uh, the wine comes out, I would love to have you guys on the show to taste For it and sure, talk man. about yeah, it. Pax is in New York a lot. So I figure sure he'd I be in New York. I'll, I'll talk to him. I'm heading out tomorrow. So when, right. I, when I get there, uh, I'll no let him rush. Know you want to do that, and we'll, we'll, we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll that be in touch. Great. So thank you for jumping on the line. Thank you for the best rant. Go meditate, take a few deep breaths, and calm the hell down, all right? <laughs> Thanks. All right, man. Bye, Go Rangers. Bye. Go Rangers. Later. See ya. All right, so our fourth award is best wine around 15 bucks. This is another question we asked our guests on our weekly wine list. Um, I wanted to ask a question to the experts about wines that were cheaper, accessible, and favorites of you know all these different experts. So I asked everyone, give me your best wine for around 15 bucks, not too much more, and suggest a white and suggest a red to me. So the winner for the best white wine overwhelmingly was Muscadet. Muscadet is a very value-oriented, delicious white wine um, from France, from the Loire, and more than often, two makers came up, Pepier, P-E-P-I-E-R-E, and Olivier. They make some terrific wines at some great prices around that price line. Then we asked in the same question, best wine around 15 bucks. give me your best red wine. And overwhelmingly, the most popular red wine, and red, you know, is the big Burgundy and Bordeaux and Colt Cali cab- category. But the winner goes to Gamay and Beaujolais. That was a region, Beaujolais, which is part of Burgundy that's making incredible wines at great values and just a delicious wine. And one of the uh, producers that 
kept coming up was a producer named Marcel Lapierre, and he makes a wine called Raison Galois. Um, the Muscadet and the Raison are both from France. So that is our best wine, around 15 bucks, red and white. All right, our fifth award was also another question based on our weekly wine list. This is a question we asked all our guests to, and the winner is a tie. So we asked everyone, tell us your favorite wine and food pairing. And we did not allow people to answer with champagne and oysters because that's kind of cliche and that's a typical answer. But surprisingly, there was a tie, and the first answer was Muscadet and oysters. Muscadet, we just talked about, is our favorite white wine. And it's a terrific wine. White, crispy, goes terrific with oysters. There's a lot of different makers and styles. And it's relatively inexpensive. So based on what our guest told us, in the future, when you go out, look for a bottle of Muscadet when there's oysters available. And the second choice, which was a tie was champagne and any fried food. It turned out that champagne came up very often as a wine pairing choice, and the bubbles and the acidity, the crispness paired really, really well with fried food, and fried chicken came up a lot, but a lot of other fried foods came up, because like I said, that that bubbly, acidic, you know, white wine just really, really paired well with it. So that's our favorite wine and food pairing, Muscadet and oysters and champagne and any fried food. All right, we're coming to our sixth and final award. And in looking back through the year, I tried to figure out what was the hottest trend and I, I didn't want to get so caught up on trends. What was the hottest wine or what was the hottest topic on the Grape Nation? Um, what just reoccurred more than, you know, anything else? What were guests talking about? What was taking up the most airtime? And there was a tie for this category, and the tie was champagne. Not surprising. It just came up in two of our other awards. And natural wines. It, these two categories consume a lot of airtime and guest interest. You know, whether it was the wine and food pairing, whether it was guests like Peter Leem or David White, um, whether it was Isabel Legeron who launched the second raw wine fair in uh, New York and then brought it to L.A. this year, um, and the fact that Brooklyn is sort of ground zero for uh, the natural wine movement. I think there's just been a lot of awareness that champagne is not just a celebratory wine, but a great wine to drink with food, a great wine to pop open, and that natural wines are really starting to get the love they deserve. They're getting the distribution. They're getting the recognition. The quality is amazing. The selection is crazy. It's wide open. And we have on the line, Vitor, do we have on the line? We have Marissa Ross, who I'm has... Here. Oh, there she is. Marissa is on the line, and I asked Marissa to come on because I think Marissa is truly one of the sincere influencers as far as natural wines, and I think she is truly a cheerleader, and I think through her Ross test, she's probably tasted <laughs> two-thirds of the... Uh, natural wines that are out there. You agree, Marissa? Um, well, I would like to think so, but probably not. There's so much, um, there's so much natural wine out there. That Which is I, a good thing. Um, I, I'm hesitant to say, but thank you so much for the kind words. I like to think that I'm a cheerleader for natural wine, and uh, thanks for having me on. Yes, and Marissa kind of walks the walk and lives the rap, and that's why I asked her to come on. And Marissa <laughs> wrote a book called What to Drink, and obviously, you know, when you walk the walk and that's your rap. That's not the name of my book. I, I, not what to drink. <laughs> Wine all the time. I'm like, <laughs> like Sam, how much I do you actually like me? And now I'm a little. First of all, I love you. That's why I asked you to come on. <laughs> and the name of the book is What to Drink. And it, it recently. No, it's Wine all the time. 
Oh, wait, what did I just say? What to drink? I said that twice. Okay, so I yeah, apologize. You did, Sam. So You're now you're losing it. You've been talking about so, champagne so much. I know. So we're going to start all over. <laughs> so Marissa was on the show this summer, and the reason I asked her to come on is for two reasons, three reasons. I think Marissa's an internet star, and is really a great voice in wine, and you could see that through her Instagram and on the internet. She had just <laughs> written a book, and I. All, you know, I think you're one of the true voices. So let's talk about the book. The book came out this year, and how is it yes, doing? The book is called Wine All the Time. Wine All the Time. The Confident Guide. To, yeah, Wine All the Time. The Confident Guide. To, or no, I'm not saying it right. Now <laughs> I you screwed messed, everything yeah, up. Again. Hold Let, on. Wine. You're going to get the book. <laughs> That's not right. Yes. It's, no, I know it now. It's Wine All the Time. The, the Casual Guide to Confident Drinks, but you had me mixed up talking about your other book. I don't even know who they who I don't that. remember. But listen to me. One of the great things about right. the book is it's a new book, and it's written by oh, you. Oh, we're not starting over. No, but I. the reason I bring <laughs> yeah. it up is I think it'll make a great holiday gift for any person that is interested in wines, is a wine lover, neophyte, or experienced, and I think you bring a great perspective to it. So I want everyone... I completely agree. As, as two people that have now messed up the title of my book, I think it's great. <laughs> now, I can, under- go out and get I can it. understand why I did. It's unforgivable for you. Before I let you go... I know, right? Yeah, before I let you go, let's stay with the topic, and just tell me why... You know, I've been doing the show for a year, and like I said, the reason I put natural wine as one of the hot categories, topics, or wines is it's really proliferated the scene here, my guests. um, It's so much more readily available. I mean, just why is that happening? I mean, you know why better than anyone. Well, all I can speak is from, you know, my personal experience. I think that... The reason that natural wine has become so prevalent is that it is still sort of a backlash from the, um, just the time of like, I feel like everyone felt like everything started tasting the same, like these big oaky wines were just so popular for so long. And that was what everyone was used to drinking. um, You you call that what? And then all of a sudden. You call that what your dad drinks, those wines, right? Exactly. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. I don't, I didn't want to drink with my dad. Right. And that's not because I have. Any issues with my dad, but right. just I, those he had wines issues didn't with really his make wine. sense with the things I was eating, and I, I just wasn't that into them for me personally. But I think that it is something where people want something different that tastes new and tastes fresh. And if you think about natural wines, especially to piggyback on what you were talking about in the last award about food pairing, natural wine is a lot lighter um, and more acidic, and actually pairs a lot better with the modern cuisine of America right. than, you know, the big, big oaky Chardonnays or Cabernets. And I think that there's just also a culture of, it's more fun. Like, it's just not so hoity-toity. It's a little bit more, you know, we're embracing these wines that are very different than what we're used to having. And with that, you're also able to embrace attitudes that are different than right. we're used to having in uh, the wine community. I mean, I think that the reason I was able to write my book, Wine All the Time, The Casual Guide to Competent Drinking. We got that um, right. <laughs> is because, and, and being accepted in the wine community, is because natural wines allow for more character. And whether that be with the way you're drinking it or the actual wine you're drinking, I think that it just opens all of that up. I agree with that. And I know that there are a lot of people that are very committed to seeking out and drinking and supporting natural wines. And there's that many more people that have no clue about it. So what you and I are encouraging people to do is, you know, go to a cool wine store, talk to the owner, ask them about, you know, some natural wines, because these guys curate a lot of stuff. There are a lot of cool restaurants. Absolutely. Marissa, you were here at Roberta's. They, they curate an incredible list of natural wines, as do other restaurants. So it's, it's readily available. And you're right. Modern cuisine, all these restaurants opening up, the wines pair with it really well. You know, so you should look out for that. What were you going to say? Absolutely. Well, I was going to say, too, you know, natural wine is just like any other wine, too, where, you know, not all of them are great. I think that there is this, there's this yeah, there's... opinion that, like, anyone that's into natural wine thinks that all natural wine is great just because it's natural. And that's not true. You know, there's going to be times where 
you may order a natural wine that you don't like or, you know, right. or it's a poorly made natural wine and that's normal. So I also always want to encourage people, like if you try a natural wine and maybe that one's not for you, it's not don't the give end. up on it entirely right. because there's a whole world of it. And it's just like anything else where there's like shitty ones and then there's great ones. Um, and sometimes you have to drink some shitty ones to get to those great ones. I agree. I mean, look at you. You started your career <laughs> drinking 4 to $7 bottles of wine. Look how you've grown. Oh, my God. Right? You're being too generous. I, I mean, know. it started with like $1.99. <laughs> Two to three. Quail Oak. All right. So listen, thank you for jumping on the line. Thank you for talking on behalf of Natural Wines, which, like I said, was yeah, an important category. And I hope to see you soon. Good luck with the book. Um, and the book <laughs> is, you. let's tell everyone the book. Yes, it's Wine All the Time, all the, the time. Casual Guide to Confident Drinking. And <laughs> kudos to Marissa. She got like a little mention in Wine Spectator, right? I was very surprised. Look at that. Yeah, I was not expecting that. Little crazy I, Marissa I like, got in the mainstream. Pr- uh, got like, into the mainstream. Pu- yeah. All right. So I hope to see you soon. Next time you're in New York, yes. please make sure you look me up. And thanks again and have a great holiday. Thank you, too. Love you, Sam. Bye. Bye. That was Marissa Ross. All right, so that concludes our first annual The Grape Nation Awards. We want to thank all our winners, and, of course, we want to thank you, the listeners. Um, We hope through the awards that we uh, kind of aggregated some of the information through the years, through the past year, and gave you some tips and all of that. Um, I will post everything on our social media sites. I'll post all the uh, award winners, one through six, um, with all the answers and all the guests. And, of course, the show will be available as a podcast, so you can go back to Stitcher and iTunes and listen to anything, uh, any of uh, the episodes and this episode, of course. We'll be back next week with our year-end special. We invited Josh Green, who's the editor of Wine and Spirits magazine, to kind of look back to 2017 and talk about wine um, in every aspect, restaurants, consumption, winemakers, all of that stuff. Um, And that'll be our last show of the year, and we'll be back in January. So if you have a question, wine happening, or event, hit me up at Sam at the Grape Nation. That's Sam at thegrapenation.com. Follow us on Facebook at The Grape Nation. Like I said, we'll post all our Grape Nation Award winners on Facebook. And you can go back and listen to the show on podcast um, if you want to hear all the uh, guest call-ins. Um, you can follow us on Instagram at Ruby and on Twitter at Ben Ruby. I want to thank our guest Tyler Thomas, who came in earlier from Deerberg and Star Lane Vineyards to talk to us about Santa Barbara wines, Central Coast wines. I want to thank you to our engineer, Vitor, who I gave a daunting task tonight to do all these phone calls and all these clips he had to play, and he did a great job. And, of course, I want to thank everyone at the Heritage Radio Network And thank you for joining us for the first annual The Grape Nation Awards. I'm Sam Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to The Grape Nation. listening to heritage radio network food radio supported by you for our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events subscribe to our newsletter enter your email at the bottom of our website heritageradionetwork.org connect with us on facebook instagram and twitter at heritage underscore radio heritage radio network is a non-profit organization driving conversations to make the world a better fairer more delicious place And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.